Okay, well, I'm Chris Busby. I've been studying the health effects of low doses of um, internal radiation for perhaps 20 years. And I've published uh, many books and papers in this area. And I want to talk about the health effects of internal radiation. Um, and I'm going to start by asking the question, why are we here? Why are all these people opposing nuclear power? Now, it's not because they're worried about the costs. And yet Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and the Greens uh, put very little energy into opposing nuclear power and these processes on the basis of the health effects caused by the releases. Even though these health effects are quite clear and scientific, scientifically proven, uh, and there are lots of books and papers written on this issue, and many eminent scientists who work in this area. And I think this is perhaps a tragic situation which must be addressed, because we should all be concerned about the health effects of these substances. And I'm going to explain how it is that everybody in the world is being poisoned, and nobody is doing anything about it. But it's because the current legal model for, um, for assessing the health effects of these substances was developed in 1952. And it's still the basis of the legal limits that are set by governments. And this ICRP radiation model, the International Commission on Radiological Protection, is embarrassing in its error in the fact that it does not consider the real health effects of internal radiation clients. And the, the recent model, which was published a few years ago, is unchanged from the model that was published very many years ago. Nothing has changed. Now, for 20 years, the, the ICRP, which was based in the UK, had a, a one permanent staff member, Dr. Jack Ballantin. And I'll come to Dr. Jack Ballantin in a minute, because he was one of the main people who was involved in ensuring that this model was being um, continued to be used by governments. Now, the report that is recently published hardly mentions Chernobyl. It doesn't discuss or refer to hundreds of peer-reviewed and published reports which show that its conclusions are just plainly wrong. They are just incorrect. And the situation is so embarrassing now to the scientific community and to the commitment of scientific philosophy which accepts truth from experiment and from observation, because this is the scientific method. And I will talk a bit about the scientific method, because we are now in an area where philosophy is no longer being used. As I said, it's been widely suggested that the effects of radiation exposure in the Chernobyl areas are not measurable, and that there is no health deterioration of the population. Yet Professor Gablakov has published books which refer to hundreds of scientific papers in the theory of the literature which show that this is not true. And showed also that there was a cover-up by the Soviet authorities and there is now a cover-up by the United Nations, the WHO, the United Nations Committees on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. And then all, and, and all after Chernobyl there has been a meltdown in the health of the exposed population. And this is an example of this meltdown. It shows population indicators in Belarus, and it's from a new book which we published a few weeks ago. And when I say we, this is the European Committee on Radiation Risk. And my colleague, Peter has a book here, the, the copy of this book here, and we'll say something about it. So you can see here that after Chernobyl, what happened was that there was a sudden reduction in the birth rate and a sudden increase in the death rate. Isn't this extraordinary? Isn't this extraordinary? That, that the radiation from that accident, the doses of which were quite low, I have to say, underneath natural background radiation, caused an absolute destruction of the population of Belarus. And what about the population of Lithuania? Do we know about the population of Lithuania? Who is measuring it? Is anybody? Because we know that huge amounts of radioactivity came from Chernobyl to Lithuania. This is from a map that was published by the European Union, showing that um, large amounts of radioactivity came to Lithuania. And we know that enormous amounts of it went to the Baltic Sea, and, and made the Baltic Sea now the most radioactive sea in the whole world, with concentrations in the Baltic Sea of about 600 
100,000 becquerels, up to 100,000 becquerels per square meter. Enormous amounts of contamination in the Baltic Sea, affecting Sweden and Finland and the Baltic states. Well, this is a picture of Jack Ballantin. He was the man I'm talking about, the scientific secretary. He met, he met with me in Stockholm on the 22nd of April, 2009. And uh, this was a meeting that was organized by Miles Goldstick there. And the meeting was videoed by Dieter Vietemar, and, and he said some very extraordinary things. Now, you have to remember this man is the top man in the ICRB. He is the scientific secretary. He organizes it, he writes all the leaves and all the reports. This is what he said. He said that the risk model could not be used to predict the health effects of radiation exposures in human populations. This is what he said. It's all on the internet, you can watch him saying it. He said for certain internal exposures, the errors in the model could be as high as two orders, up to a thousand times that is, two orders of magnitude. So actually, it explains quite a lot if, the, if, the risk, if his own risk model, and he accepts that his risk model for certain internal radionuclides is in error by that sort of magnitude. He also, third, he said that now that he was no longer employed by the ICRP, he could say what he liked. And he agreed, he agreed that the ICRP committee and the United Nations committees, whose publication, publications that the ICRP model depend on, had been wrong in not examining the evidence from the Chernobyl accident, and also much other evidence that showed that their own risk model was incorrect for internal exposures. So this is the man himself, the ICRP, admitting that their risk model is wrong. And yet all of the countries of the world still employ that risk model. All of them, including Lithuania, as I found yesterday by asking the gentleman who was the senator in, in, in charge of nuclear waste. Now evidence that radiation exposures are very much more harmful than had been thought have continued to increase throughout the radiation century. And you can see that in 1952, if you look on this graph here, 19, from 1952 to the present day, the understanding that radiation is much more dangerous than anybody thought has continued to, to, to increase. And now we are at a point where no more uh, changes in the risk model, in, in the safe dose of radiation, that the radiation limits can be, can be done without closing all the nuclear power stations. This is why this graph has stopped. It stopped at the bottom, not because it shouldn't continue, but because they cannot uh, afford to allow it to go any further, because if they did so, nuclear power stations would all have to sh shut, and I will argue that they shouldn't have to shut. So in 1997, we had um, considered the health effects of internal radiation at a meeting in Brussels, where there were a number of eminent scientists, including the late Dr. Alice Stewart and Dr. Rosalie Motel, other people. And after this meeting, we formed uh, uh, an independent group of scientists called the European Committee on Radiation Risk. Um, and the radiation risk report of this was published first in 2003. Uh, and this report use, uses broadly the same ideas as the ICRP risk model. So it's, it's, a, it's an alternative model for assessing the health effects of internal radiation. And what it does is it adds certain factors for some of the internal radionuclides, some of the substances which get inside the body, but which are not like normal radiation because they bind to the DNA. They actually have chemical affinity for the DNA. And this is why they're so much more dangerous. And examples are strontium-90 and uranium-238. Now, by 2009, more than 40 radiation expert, experts from countries all over the world had joined the European Committee on Radiation Risk. Very eminent scientists, very eminent scientists, heads of departments of radiation biology in many, uh, many universities throughout the world. And we had a conference in, in uh, Lesbos, on the Greek island of Lesbos, um, and more than 20 of these scientists from England, USA, Canada, Japan, India, Russia, Germany, Belarus, France, and the Ukraine gathered to make presentations of evidence on the health effects of the Chernobyl accident and other health effects that followed from exposure to internal radiation. And at this conference, which incidentally is the matter of this book that we will talk about a bit later, they 
discuss the serious inadequacy of the ICORP model, which is effectively now killing millions of people. Millions of people are dying throughout the world because of the application of an incorrect risk model, which doesn't take into consideration the evidence. And here's some of these people, these scientists. So I, I, I mean, I don't want to take too long, so I won't read through all of them. But some of them are extremely eminent. For instance, we have Professor Carmel Mothersill, who is the, the, the world expert on genomic instability, which is um, a, a, a recent discovery uh, re relating to how um, radiation causes cancer. And we have heads of departments of many large institutions in the ex Soviet Union countries, various other people. You can see there's Professor Yuri Bandashevsky, who has discovered many, many effects of radiation uh, in, in, the, um, in the contaminated territories of Belarus, uh, including a very interesting discovery that small amounts of cesium-137 cause heart attacks in children because they destroy the heart muscle, the cardiac muscle is destroyed. Anyway, at this meeting, and this is an important bit so I'm going to go through it, there was uh, a discussion about what we could do. Because it's easy to, we have lots of conferences like this where people talk and everybody agrees or disagrees and then the conference is finished and everybody goes home yeah. and then, then, then it's all, there's no, there's no consequent action. So what we did is we made a statement called the Lesbos Statement, which you can, be, you can find it all on the internet at that website up there, youradcom.org. And it talks about all of the things that I've just said to you about how the ICRP risk model is used worldwide by federal, state, and government bodies. And incidentally, it's now being used to tell the people of Japan that they're, that they're quite safe in living in areas of very high concentrations of cesium and plutonium and um, strontium-90 and a whole range of very, very dangerous substances, which are almost certainly going to result in enormous deaths to, the, to adults and to children. And what we say is that the ICRP risk model coefficients are out of date and that their use leads to risks being significantly underestimated. And we say that there is a huge yield of non-cancer illnesses, in, 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 uh, illnesses. So you're not just talking about cancer, you're talking about heart attacks and strokes and, and just about everything, early diabetes. And all of these increases which occurred in territories where there was contamination by these substances. We found these, the whole range of these health effects after Hiroshima in the populations there, and we also found them in the populations of the ex-Soviet Union territories. So what we are happy is we are in the middle of a scientific uh, earthquake, if you like. There's a, there's a huge change in the understanding of, these, uh, of the effects of these, these, these radionuclides. And yet the ICRP is still not changing its risk model, and governments are still using it. Uh, but of course, Valentin decided that he'd had enough of, of um, being in the firing line when there was so much evidence showing that his model was wrong. So he resigned, and the ICRP uh, left Sweden, which is where it was at that time, and relocated to Canada. Now, lots and lots of uses of radioactivity, which are underpinned by Pogachar, which are permitted by the ICRP risk model, and this is a list of some of them. That of course, the main one here is the nuclear energy fuel cycle from mining of uranium, as Charles Bellstick was talking about, resulting in lots of deaths in people who live near the mine tailings. Um, I was in South Africa about a year ago and I found a whole a tribe of people who, were, who had been relocated and were living in a village that was sited on top of mine tailings. And the concentrations of radon and uranium there were absolutely enormous, and these people were certainly suffering extreme ill health, but of course nobody will be studying them. And then we have military reactors in ships and submarines and depleted uranium weapons, or, or even uranium weapons now as we find out. You've been used in all the battlefields of the world, and then of course nuclear testing, and then uh, fertilizers and so forth. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the problems with, with the model on the basis of scientific philosophy. Of course, the basic assumptions of the ICRP model are incorrect at the physical and chemical level. And epidemiology shows effects which occur at doses which the model predicts are far too low to show anything. Now, in view of the time, I will discuss a few examples of the failure. I mean, I have a, a, an enormous stack of examples of the failure. I can 
and talk properly all day on the basis of my own studies, never mind about other people's studies. But here are some. From the point of view of theory, the main problem is that the uh, doses from internal regular nuclides are localized. In, in science, we say this, there is anisotropy. The ICRP risk model assumes that the doses are uniform over the whole body because the whole concept of absorbed dose, absorbed dose is how you measure radioactivity. So when they say your dose is 2 millisieverts, they mean that over your whole body you receive 2 millijoules per kilogram. This is energy per unit mass. This is how dose is defined. And it was defined like this in 1952. And this is okay for external radiation, but it doesn't work for internal radiation. Because actually, if you take the dose from, uh, to a cell from a single alpha particle track, the dose is 500 millisieverts. So in other words, you get 500 annual doses from a single decay from plutonium into a cell. So clearly it's impossible, and they must have known all along that it was impossible, to regulate internal radiation in the same way as you regulate external radiation. And of course, the main problem, uh, since, since the target for, for radiation is the DNA, it's a, it's a genotoxin and causes genetic damage. Um, the, the target being the DNA, the, the, the main problem is if you break two strands of the DNA at the same time, because when it, when, then, then it can't repair itself. And there are a number of ways in which you can get high enough energy to, to cause the two strand breaks. And one of them, of course, is if you have a particle inside the body which is giving more than one decay, and then there are all sorts of other, other theoretical reasons which I won't go into. But the reason I put this up is because this is all going out on the internet. So people look at this at their leisure. And then there are various problems with epidemiology. There are lots and lots of increases in, in risk of low doses, including, as I said, the Chernobyl effects. And there's a, a, a study of infants, which I will return to, infant leukemia. Then, then there's a, the problem of child leukemias near radioactively contaminated sites that we heard about from Professor Goldblatt. Um, and, then, and actually, there's an increase in adult cancers, as I will, as I will show, you know, radioactively contaminated sites in a nuclear power station. So it's not just childhood leukemia. The concentration on childhood leukemia in your nuclear sites is a mistaken one, because what it does is it looks for uh, effects in very small populations. The number of children who live within five kilometers of a nuclear site is tiny. But if you look at the number of adults who live within five kilometers of a nuclear site, and particularly for breast cancer, every single study that I have, you know, I have myself done, and there will be another one coming out in December, I have to say, which I can't talk about because it's coming out on the television, um, they all show a, 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 a significant increase in risk in the nuclear sites. Then we have increases near uh, contaminated seas, like the, like the Irish Sea and like the Baltic Sea, where people living near the coast have high levels of cancer, and I'm sure you will find this effect in Lithuania and in Latvia because the Baltic Sea is extremely radioactive. So people living on that radioactive sea will suffer the same high risks of cancer that we found in, our, in the Irish Sea when I was working for the Irish government. Then we have effects uh, following the global weapons fallout in the 1960s. And that this produced a cancer epidemic, as I will show. So the current cancer epidemic is, is mainly caused by the global weapons fallout. Then there were effects in the, in the bomb test veterans and in the Gulf War veterans and the, 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 the people who were exposed to depleted uranium. And a very important study was done in 2004, which has been mentioned already, which was a study by uh, Martin Tondell of cancer risks in northern Sweden after Chernobyl. And what Tondell did was absolutely fantastic. He, he, he did what is obvious, but anyway, the fact is he did it and he managed to get it published. And what it showed was that there was a significant correlation between the levels of cancer after Chernobyl in Sweden and the doses from Chernobyl. This is very important. Now, the, the ICRP model is very physically simplistic. And it, it, it just assumes that the outcome of exposure is cancer or leukemia. It assumes that the cancer risk is linearly proportional to the absorbed dose. And it assumes that the relationship between cancer and absorbed dose is given entirely by studies of external radiation, uh, which were done on the Japanese victims of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, the so-called lifespan study. And this is where the cancer risk 
great coefficients comes from. It comes from Japanese people who were exposed at the time of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. It is not related to people who were exposed to internal radiation. Well, radiation causes cancer because it's, ge it's genotoxic. So whatever radiation it is, it always ends up by little tracks of radiation in the body which leave these structured parts of ions. And these ions, these little hot, sparky, chemical, reactive substances, they react with DNA and break the DNA and they cause the code to change. So it, it's the density of the ionization on the track that is the key quantity, not the average absorbed dose. This is how the ICRP uh, uh, defined dose, mass, with the energy per unit mass. And this is actually taken from one of their public publications. You can see that the irradiation is all coming from the outside, and so every cell in the body gets approximately the same dose. But of course, in reality, as we see here from this plutonium particle picture in a rat lung, this is a, a rat lung photomicrograph uh, taken by the French nuclear industry. You can see these little stars, these are called alpha stars. stars up there, they show a lot of points of the way out, see, these things. <coughs> so you can see here that all of, the, all of the energy is in one place. And in, and, and in areas where there are no particles, there's no blend, there's no energy. But what the ICRP risk model does is it takes all that energy, this energy here, and it dilutes it into the entire body. And this is, this is quite wrong. So, let me just go past all of this because it's, it's no. Okay. So as I said, there are many internal exposures. There are situations where the local dose of the DNA is very high. And some of the examples of these I give here. Um, and, and we start with substances which chemically bind strongly to DNA, like strontium-90, barium-140, plutonium and uranium. And of course also elements that are absorbed as micron diameter particles. And we, we find this with people who are exposed to uranium from the, from the uranium weapons in the Gulf War. And there are a range of other uh, situations where internal radiation causes much higher energy deposition at the DNA. Um, and of course, therefore, what the, the European Committee Vision on Radiation Risk does is it increases the uh, hazard factor by multiplying by, by a, a number which is associated with the amount of energy that's likely to be there. It's called the weighting factor. And these weighting factors are based on epidemiology. And these are the epidemiolog some of the epidemiological studies which back up the European Committee on Radiation Risk Model. Uh, of course, one of them is childhood leukemias in a nuclear site. And this is not just the kick study. There are many, many uh, nuclear sites where childhood leukemias have been found all over the world. Then there's a very interesting study of infant leukemia in Europe after Chernobyl exposures, and this is very hard to argue with. It's not a Chernobyl effect. Then cancer, as I said, in populations differentially exposed to the nuclear testing for about in the 60s, and various other things. Now, if I turn to the Kick study, which you just heard about, you can see here that it's not only the Kick study in Germany that shows high levels of childhood leukemia. You can see that in Sellafield, Dunray, La Hague in France, Oldermaston, Hinkley Point, Harwell, this was a study I did, uh, Krimmel in Germany, Ulich, Larsbeck in Sweden, all of these nuclear sites have got a high, higher than normal uh, uh, significant increase in childhood leukemia. And this was first discovered in 1983, so it's nothing new. So the nuclear industry and their scientists have known about this for a very long time, but they have continued to deny it on the basis of the ICRB risk model does not predict it. Now the interesting thing is, is that I want you to see that, it, that you can see in the third column there, in order for the, for the uh, risk model to be correct, there has to be an error of between 100 and 300 in the case of Sellafield and higher errors in the case of other plants which discharge less radioactivity. So you, you need to look for an error of between 200 and 1,000 times, maybe more. So the idea that the, that the ICRP risk model is wrong is already there in the fear of being studies that show these increases in childhood leukemia near nuclear sites.
So there is really only one possibility here, and that is that the RCRP model is wrong. So we come to the point of asking how it is that governments and the ICRP and the nuclear industry lobby continue to support what is clearly a wildly incorrect risk model. And how is it that Greenpeace and the Greens and the FOE also effectively support this model because they never talk about the effects of low level radiation. They oppose nuclear on the basis of economic arguments and, and, and very, very vague ideas which are never really explicitly formulated. And the reason that they do is they say that it is a scientific, that the, the, the people who are opposing it, people like myself, like Professor Gabakov, Dr. Kerbein, many, many of us, they say we are not being scientific. But let's ask, what are the methods of science? What are the methods of science? Well, I'm just giving you three of the main methods of science. This is scientific philosophy. There's the canon of, of agreement, which states that whatever there is in common between the antecedent conditions of the phenomenon can be supposed to be the cause or related to the cause of the phenomenon. This is logic, and this comes from work by John Stuart Mill in the 19th century. Science is a very, very powerful tool, but we have to use the methods of science if we're going to be scientists. We can't decide which bits of science we want to use and which bits of science we don't want to use. The writer Martin Amos once said about science, he said, I don't know much about science, but I know what I like. And of course, this is how the nuclear industry operates. So we can see that the canon of agreement says that what there is in common between the antecedents of the phenomenon, so in other words, radiation in nuclear sites, is supposed to be the cause of the phenomenon, childhood leukemia. So that's okay then. Then there's a canon of difference which says that the, the difference in the conditions under which an effect occurs and that in which it does not occur must be the cause or related to the cause of that effect. So in other words, we have childhood leukemia near nuclear sites. We don't have childhood leukemia near coal-fired sites. So, or if you like to look at it in terms of the control, you say the people who are not living near the site in the nation of the national background have a lower rate of childhood leukemia. This is science. This is philosophy. This is what we should be. We should be philosophers and scientists. This is how people think. And then, of course, the third one, which is the most important one, and which nobody ever considers, is called the principle of instance confirmation. And what this says is that the degree of belief in a causal relationship increases in proportion to the number of times it occurs. So, in other words, if you find one child of leukemia cluster, you can say, maybe it's chance. If you find two, you have to say, well, that doesn't seem like chance. If you find six, you have to start considering that maybe something's going on here. And that is the principle of instance confirmation. But this is never used. Because what, what the, all the nuclear industry scientists do, and what the government people do, is they take each study on its own as if it was the only evidence of harm, and then individually attacks it by comparing its findings with those of the predictions of the Japanese uh, lifespan studies. This is a very important point, and I have to get this across to you, the people on the television and the people on the internet as well, as well as all you wonderful people here. Because they pick off each study in turn and attack it in turn. They, they fractionate the, 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 the evidence. They cut the evidence into little slices, and they defeat one slice at a time. And then they say, oh, there's no problem. So it does not if it does not conform to the predictions for each study, then they throw it out. Now the probability of an event occurring is P1. So if we can think of dice here. If you want to throw a dice and you get you want to know the probability of getting a uh, six, the probability is of course one in six. Now the probability you can throw two dice is now one in six times one in six, so that's one in thirty-six. And if you throw three dice, it goes up by multiplying the probability each time. So you can make the same argument with regard to nuclear sites, you can make the same argument with regard to studies that show that radioactivity causes ill health. So it's not a question of just taking each study and arguing that that study is wrong. We can multiply all of these studies together, and there's in fact a way that we can do this. It's called Bayesian inference. And I don't want to try and give you a lecture on Bayesian inference at the moment, because it takes rather a long time, and it's quite a complicated business. But what Bayesian inference does, it's a, it's a statistical way of, 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 of increasing your belief in any proposition by bringing in evidence that that proposition is correct. And then you refine your belief and then bring in some more evidence, then you refine your belief and so on. So this is a way in, in which we can use all of these
these studies, all of the hundreds of studies referred to by Professor Yablokov, all of the studies of childhood cancer in your nucleosides, to form a, a probabilistic belief which is equal to 100% that the ICRP are wrong. And I'm going to just give you some examples. There are three examples that are important. The first is the Chernobyl in infant leukemias. The second is Tom Dell's cancer in Sweden, which I've mentioned. The third one is very interesting because it shows effects at tiny, tiny doses after Chernobyl on the ratio of boys and girls who were born in countries very, very far away from Chernobyl, where the doses were, were, were marginal, were minute, were much smaller than natural background. I have also done various studies of cancer near nuclear power stations in the United Kingdom, and one of them is coming up soon. This one at the bottom, Wilbur, that's going to hit the news in around about Christmas time. And at all of these different nuclear power stations, we have found geno genomic effects or genotoxic effects. We found increases in breast cancer, increases in child leukemia, and increases also in a number of other cancers. And they won't, there's not enough time to tell you about all of those. We've also found cancer increases in adults living near the contaminated coasts and estuaries in North Wales. Uh, we found an 18 fold excess of cancer in contaminated areas of North Wales. Uh, and we found uh, significant trends as you get close to the coast in cancer rates, very, very close to the coast. About one kilometer from the coast, you have a 30% increase in cancer. And of course, in the Baltic Sea, we are sure that this also happens, but we haven't had a chance to look at this yet because they will not release the data to us for the small areas, but we are still trying to get that data. This is this social spiral so in Stockholm. And I have to say that the head of the social stylus in Stockholm, uh, Lars Eric Holm, is actually the ex-head of the uh, Radiation Risk Agency, the ICRP. So we have some very powerful people in charge of uh, statistical data relating to ill health. And uh, often these people have connection with the nuclear industry. And you cannot get more of a connection with the ICRP than being its president. Um, so, also, there, as I said, plenty of um, Chernobyl effects that have been, been looked at. But here's something about the cancer epidemic, because I, don't, I, I, I could probably talk all morning, but I'm going to have to rush through this a bit. So, what we did here, where are we? Yes. We looked at the increases in cancer in two areas, England and Wales. And incidentally, this is the origin of the ECRR 2003 risk model. This is where we got the number 300 from. Because England and Wales have the same cancer registry, and so therefore the cancer rates in these, the age standardized cancer rates in these two countries are, are, are similarly calculated. And so what you can see from this graph is the age standardized, uh, standardized registration ratio. Uh, that should be 100 in 1974 for England, you can see it is. And so this represents an increase in cancer in Wales and an increase in cancer in England. You can see that suddenly the cancer in England goes up after Chernobyl, but that's not the interesting bit. The interesting bit is that the cancer started to increase in Wales in about 1977. And you must ask the question, why? Because we know that cancer is caused by genotoxin. It's caused by something that causes damage to DNA. So something must have appeared sometime in the past in Wales, but not in England, or rather more of it in Wales and less of it in England. Because suddenly there was an increase in cancer in Wales and no increase in cancer in England. So what could it be? Well actually, it could be only one thing. Because Wales has a lot of rainfall and therefore it has a lot of uh, uh, fission products from the global weapons testing. And it's not even just theoretical because all of these were measured. So the, the, the British government measured very carefully the concentrations of cesium and strontium and other substances in the, in, the, in the population of whales, in the bones, in their teeth, and also in the environment and in the milk. And as a result of the increases that which were occurring around about the 60s, there was of course the, uh, the, the te test ban treaty between Kennedy and Khrushchev. Now if you take the, um, the cumulative dose from strontium 90, and you push it forward 20 years, you can sit it exactly on the top of the cancer increases in Wales. And I hope you, you look here, you can see the shape of this curve is not like a straight line. It goes up and then it goes flat for a piece. Let me show you with the little point in here, see? So it goes up and then it goes flat for a bit, and then it goes up again and then it increases slightly. And this is rather an odd shape, 
that you can see that the cancer goes up in that shape, but so does the cumulative dose from strontium-90. And the reason for this flat piece here is because there was a partial test burn treaty in 1959. So there was no increase in cancer in, in strontium-90 for a short period of time here, in 1959-61. And there's now no increase in cancer in Wales in the same period 20 years later. And if you look, if you use this correlation in order to work out what the, what the risk coefficient is, you find that the risk coefficient is 330 times higher than, than, than the ICRP says. Now this 330 is a very interesting number, because it's the number that we need to explain the child in leukemia clusters and many, many other things. For example, Sellafield and the hard child leukemia is factors 300 for the bigger nucleoside cancer like kick and and so on, it's more like a thousand. Now for infant leukemia after Chernobyl, which is a very difficult, uh, um, a, a, a difficult circumstance to explain in any other way but Chernobyl, the, the risk, the risk uh, difference, the error if you like to call it, is 400. And, and, and cancer in northern Sweden after Chernobyl, Tom Dell's, uh, Tom Dell's findings were that it was in error, East ICR, uh, ICRP was in error by 400 times. And this is why he was sacked by Lars Eric Hull, and he was sent to work with children and taken away from studies of radiation. Um, and of course, we know why Lars Eric Hull threw him out because Lars Eric Hull, as I've said before, is the ex head of the ICRP. And of course, breast cancer, neonucleosides, various other things. And these are the papers that, uh, that I wrote about the infant leukemia with my colleague uh, Molly Scott Cato, and a very recent one where I actually pointed out that the risk factor error is a cyclone. He was making shot at what he was using. What? He was making shot at what he was using on the power. You're running out of time. Okay, okay, I'm going to set through all of this now. But the, this you can see, um, this you can see on the, uh, I'll, I'll put these slides up for short periods of time so people can then see them on the internet. Yeah. Okay, that's the way to do it. So I'll just go click, 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 and then I'll come to something. Too. So please conclude the point. Yeah, yeah, okay. So there we are, let's just turn down. Oh yes, now you must see this one. This is the live birth sex odds in Denmark after Chernobyl. You see that suddenly the number of boys to the number of girls changes. This is in Denmark. We're not talking about Belarus now. And here's Yugoslavia. You see the same thing happen there. All of this stuff is in this new book that we've published. This is a paper by Harvard Show, who is a member of the ECRR and came to the conference in, uh, in uh, and of course, as a result of applying this model, and of course, and everybody wants to know this, we applied the, the ECR our risk model to Fukushima, and we found that there would be 200,000 extra cancers in the next in the 10 million population in the 200 kilometer radius around the Fukushima plant, and in 50 years, 400,000. And this just fits in with Tom Dell's findings. So effectively, what we did is we took Tom Dell's findings in Sweden, we transferred them to Fukushima, and just increased the, the exposure. And then, of course, also uranium. I've just published a number of papers about the effects of uranium in Fallujah, Iraq. We measured the uranium in the air. And again, where we, we find a factor of about 1,000 between the health effects and the expectation. And this is a picture of some work that my PhD student, he's just got his PhD last week, at Ulster, was doing, looking at the uh, way in which uranium amplifies natural background radiation. And uranium is this one here side there, and this is the effect of water, so you can see that there's something there. So uh, this, is my, this is my conclusion, right? we're, getting, we're almost, almost there, right? So I'm not that panic. Um, I'm, I'm going to get shot from over there. So the ICRP model must be, must be replaced by the ECR model, otherwise there will be more sick adults and sick children. And there is at the moment a, a systematic destruction of the human genome across the whole world, with loss of fertility and increases in ill health. And if we develop nuclear energy, it must be based on political decisions that address the true effects. And the people who vote for this must understand the true effects of what they're voting for. And I also call at this meeting on Greenpeace and the other environmental non government organizations to support the ECRR model and to abandon their faith in the scientists who work 